Good evening once again. Glad that you're here tonight. Uh, normally Greg's here on Wednesday nights. He's going to be taking a, a little four-week break and we're going to cover some other things. We're actually going to do a class on personal evangelism and uh, I'm doing it a little different again. There is a syllabus to the class. If you'd like to get it, go to uh, the Packing House website and you'll see handouts and uh, if you click on that, it'll download the syllabus for you and then uh, each week there may be some extra handouts and there's going to be some test. Hey, I thought I finished with that in school. What's going on here? I, it's just to encourage you to go over the material again and learn again. So we're going to be covering five, five or six different sections in four weeks. We're going to talk about should we evangelize? I know that at a church like this, that's kind of a crazy question because we see it modeled for us every Sunday morning. You know, they're always praying for people who want to come to Christ. And I know that a lot of people here bring people to Christ. But there's other people who aren't quite sure, well, how do I do this? Or maybe I'm afraid to do this, or I'm not sure why to do this. So we're going to talk about should we evangelize? And then if we should, why don't we? Because a lot of people have a variety of reasons uh, fear, embarrassment, other things. And we're going to talk about those things and see what the scripture says. The third session is going to be about power for evangelism. I need God's power to accomplish God's work. And we're going to look into that. And then the, the um, let's see, that's the third section. One, two, three, four. Fourth is a burden for evangelism. Why would I want to do this? Why should I do this? And then the fifth one is going to be methods of evangelism. I know that some of you are familiar with certain methods, certain uh, evangelistic characteristics, but perhaps we'll have some others that might give you some ideas about how to reach people in our world for Jesus Christ. And we see the things that are going on in the world around us, and we read the news, and we think, man, what would be a better time for people to come to Christ? When have you ever seen more need for people to come to Christ? There's so many crisis things going on around us that people need to find Jesus Christ, to find answers. I don't know about you, but as I go about my daily business, people are always like, did you see what happened over here? Did you see what happened there? Did you see what happened there? Yeah, but you know what? We need to look up. We need to focus on the things above, on the things of the Lord. So would you stand with me one more time? We're going to pray again. I don't think we can pray enough. So let's go before the throne of God once again. Father, tonight, once again, we thank you for this place that we can come and we can fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We thank you that we can own Bibles, Lord, that we can read them, that we can discuss them with one another. We can have Bible studies. We thank you that we still have the privilege to meet openly and freely, and we have no fear of persecution for doing that. Father, we do want to lift up our brothers and sisters around the world who don't have that privilege and who aren't able to do that. And we ask that you would pour your spirit upon us now. We thank you for the time of worship that prepares our hearts, Lord, that allows us to lay aside the things of this world, the cares of this day, that we might be open to receive all that you want to give to us by your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is so personal that you know what each and every person needs to hear tonight. And we ask that you would speak to each and every person individually and that you might be glorified in all things that are said and done here tonight. And we ask these things now in your most holy and precious name, Jesus. And all of God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. And we're going to begin our first section, Should We Evangelize? Should We, should we Witness? When I talk to people about evangelizing or witnessing, I get two reactions. One of them is exciting. It's like, it's exciting to see people come to the Lord. It's exciting to see people uh, receive forgiveness. It's exciting to see people whose sins are taken away. And on the other hand, the other reaction is, it's terrifying. You want me to go out and talk to people that I don't know? Well, I don't do that kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm shy. I'm, I'm reserved. I I, uh, I've never gone and done that, and I, I, it would kill me if I did that now. I think I'd just die. So it's exciting and it's terrifying, but we believe that it's something we should do. Now, again, that sounds kind of strange. Uh, when you go into a church like this and you say, should you evangelize, most of you would respond with, yes, we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone everywhere, right? 
We know that, we know that, but do we do that? Not all the time. We know we should do it, but we don't do it all the time. You see, there's a lot of other influences in our world around us. A lot of people think, well, evangelism, you say evangelism, I begin to think of evangelist. So Billy Graham was an evangelist, right? And he went out and he evangelized. Louis Palau was an evangelist and he went out and he evangelized. And there's lots of other guys around today and they're evangelizing. So, hey, the job's getting done, right? Does it let you off the hook? Well, not necessarily. Uh, uh, others believe we don't have to. You see, we believe that God has set everything up. He knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. So why do I need to go and say anything? If they're going to get saved, if God's going to save them, he's going to save them. doesn't matter if I say anything or not. Uh, and other people, they're not going to get saved, and they're just going to die and be lost. So uh, why do I have to worry about that? Not my problem. It's not quite what the Scripture says. I would that none should perish and all should come to repentance. And we're going to see some interesting things here uh, that God likes to use people. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants us to share his love and grace with others. Now, I'm shocked by that, frankly, a lot of times. Why would God want to use me? I always come up with this scenario in my head where God could just open the clouds and go, I'm God, you're not. And of course, then we'd just melt, right? But he doesn't do that way. He wants to use us. He wants us to be a part of the process. It's not that he needs us as a part of the process. It's that he wants to use us. He wants to bless us. I think one of the main stories I think of is Cornelius. If you've looked in the book of Acts, Cornelius is seeking God. I want to know who the God of this land Israel is. I want to know who it is that these people believe in. I want to find out about this God. And an angel shows up at Cornelius' house. Wouldn't that be cool? Oh, it'd be a little freaky. Every time you see an angel show up, what's the first thing the scripture says? Do not be afraid. <laughs> it's a little freaky. I have the answers. I know what you need. I know what you want, but I'm not going to tell you. I want you to go down to Joppa. There's a man there. His name is Peter, and Peter's going to come and answer all your questions. Peter's going to tell you everything you need. We know that, that Peter was a, a normal person. We know that Peter had his faults, had his shortcomings, but God wanted to use him anyway, and God wants to use you, and God wants to use me. We're encouraged all the way through the Old and New Testament, you'll find some places that say, well, evangelism and witnessing, that's a New Testament thing. No, it's been all the way through the Scripture. God has called his people Israel to be a light unto the Gentiles, to be a light to the world, that they could come to know the love of God. And so we see men like Abraham and Jeremiah and Solomon in uh, New Testament, Paul the Apostle, and most importantly, Jesus encouraged us to give the gift that keeps on giving, and that's the gift of eternal life. So we're encouraging each other as we gather here to be a witness to our dying world and bring light into the darkness. So let's look at a few of these encouragement. This usually uh, overflows from a relationship with Christ, but uh, one of the first scriptures is Proverbs 11.30. It says, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. By the way, I hope you brought your notebooks and pens, because I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures again tonight, like we always do in these classes, and hopefully you would write them down so that you can go and look them up later on. Really important scripture comes out of the book of Acts. Remember, Paul was ministering in Thessalonica, uh, and then he was later on moving on to Berea, and he said, these in Berea are more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word of God with all readiness, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And that's what I would like you to do. Uh, you're here tonight to receive. I want to give out the word of God the best I can, as pure as I can, as strong as I can, but I want you to do your due diligence and go home and look these things up and go, hey, is that what this says? Is this in context? Is he telling me the truth? You're never going to be able to stand before the throne of God and say, well, Pastor Bob said. That doesn't count. 
okay? What did Jesus say? What does God's word say? So check these things out. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. So underline that in your Bible. The, the fruit of the righteous, it's comparing our lives to a tree. When you see trees, they look nice. When you really notice trees is when they bloom, right? When the flowers come out on them. I love uh, the first trees that bloom are the almond trees, all the white blossoms, and then the cherry trees with the pink blossoms. The trees that really get our attention, at least my attention, is when, oh, look, there's big orange globes on there and red globes, and maybe I can go up there and taste some of that stuff. It's producing fruit. We want it to produce fruit. We want to feed on that thing. So the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. This is the Christian life by example. He attracts others to Jesus. And he is the tree of righteousness, one who is in right standing with the Lord. He's a fruitful tree and a bountiful tree that draws other people. And then he makes the jump here. And he that wins souls is wise. I want to attract people. I want them to see Jesus' righteousness. Why do I want to do this? Because I want them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm out looking for them. Notice here, Solomon didn't say the man that wins money is wise. There are those who have attained their own riches and they think they're pretty smart. You can find hundreds of them on the internet every day. Come to my class. I'll show you how you can be a billionaire by next week. Uh, because I'm smart, because I work this system. I've been through so many systems, but I've got it figured out now, and I can show you how to do this. He doesn't give place to the uh, poet or the philosopher. He who is a poet is wise. No, I didn't say that. He who is a philosopher is wise. Didn't say that. He gives no place to great statesmen or clever rulers or diplomats. He doesn't even say he who preaches is necessarily wise. Because you know what? There's a lot of men standing in pulpits across the country and around the world who are preaching, but not necessarily the gospel, not necessarily the truth. So uh, you make plans, you lay down rules for others, and you may think you're wise, but your plans may not be exactly what the Lord has for you. You have to be spending time with the Lord. Now, I've met brothers... I'll admit it, I've actually been a part of some of these groups where we realize the world needs to be evangelized. The world needs to be reached for Jesus Christ. And um, especially when we were younger and single, we'd stay up all night, we'd go to a coffee shop, and we would pull out a napkin and we would devise a plan where the entire world could be saved within a year. And the next morning it's like, what was, why did I write that down? I don't know. But uh, we, I call them coffee visions coffee visions. They don't seem to, to really work, but uh, you know, God has given different men different ways to evangelize, different gifts and different abilities. So this is true, whatever your style or method of soul winning or evangelism might be. Paul was a very logical, very philosophical soul winner. He would go to Mars Hill. He would go to the synagogues. He would engage people in conversations. Uh, the person might be like an Apollos, an eloquent speaker, eloquent speaker. I can't even speak, so I'm not like an Apollos, but an eloquent speaker who could gather a crowd. They wanted to hear the words that he had to say. He could be like um, Peter, very rugged, gets right to the point, you know. You've seen those guys out on the street, haven't you? Get right or get left. That's your choice. Um, they're kind of fun to listen to sometimes. I couldn't live with that all the time, but it's, it's fascinating to see how God uses different people. So what I want to tell you right up front is I'm not going to give you the proven method to bring people to Christ, okay? Because that's going to have to be the Spirit of God ministering to you and to your heart. What I want to do, though, is share tools, share experiences, and uh, perhaps you'll be able to grasp some of those tools, take hold of some of these things, and share with other people. So I'm going to suggest several methods but again, the main thing is for you to spend time with Christ and find out his method for you. He created you as an individual. He created Billy Graham to be Billy Graham. I've met several other guys who have told me, I'm going to take over Billy Graham's ministry. I'm going to be just like Billy Graham. You know what? I think God wanted Billy Graham to be Billy Graham, and he wants you to be you. He'll use you with the gifts that he's given to you. So spend time with Christ. Soul, uh, the wisdom in soul wis uh, winning is doing something eternal. It's something that lasts beyond time. 
When the earth passes away, and, and some of you are old enough to have thought about this. Some of you are just way too young to even know what I'm talking about. But when the earth passes away, all the things you've collected, all the treasures you've collected are worthless. You can't take them with you. I had a um, storage bin, a big one, okay, one of those 40-foot cans. And uh, I remember talking to my son one day, and I said, when I die, what are you going to do with all of this? And he looked right at me and said, take a match to it. And I, I was offended. I said, there is important things in here. There's precious things in here. And he said, to you maybe. And that's the way it is. What is the only thing we can take to heaven? People that we've led to Jesus Christ. That'll be our fruit. We'll have memorials in heaven. What can be wiser than glorifying God? What can be wiser next to glorifying God than bringing people to Christ, blessing our fellow man. Someone once said, the only thing you can take to heaven are people you brought to Jesus Christ. So soul winning reminds us that we're in a war, okay? We need to carefully seek our captain's direction, and so I want to give you some of our captain's words, okay? He begins by saying, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. For me to be able to teach them to observe what he's commanded me, I need to know what he's commanded me so that I can pass on what he's given to me. He's promised us wisdom in the book of James. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, uh, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. He goes on and he says, he's promised us power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses unto me. We're going to get into this more a little bit later on, but that word witness is a very interesting word, okay? Uh, if you have a Strong's Concordance or a Bible Concordance, look up the word witness in the book of Acts, okay? The word in the Greek is martis. Martis. Where do, where, what English word do we get from martis? martyr, someone who lays down their life for a cause. I'm going to give you power to be a martyr, a living sacrifice, it tells us in Romans 12, to lay down your life, to lay aside your goals, your desires, and bring people to me, bring people to the truth. So you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me, Acts 1.8. He will give us boldness. The righteous, we're told, are as bold as a lion in the book of Proverbs. And then we read, Now, Lord, look on their hearts and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your words. This was the disciples. Do you remember in the New Testament? Uh, they were taken. They were beaten for preaching Christ. And instead of going, Oh, woe is me. They're going to send me to jail. This is, I better stop witnessing. They said, Hey, we are identified with Christ to the point that they beat us up. Isn't that cool? Let's go out and share some more. Let's see what happens next. I love the attitude of Paul and Silas. They threw us in prison. Let's start a worship night. Let's start singing. Let's start ministering to other people in here. So the righteous are as bold as lion. Lord, hear their threats and grant your servants that with boldness they may speak your word. That's my prayer for each one here tonight that God would grant you boldness to speak his word. And therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. 2 Corinthians 3.12. Jesus Christ is the one in whom we have boldness. The stakes are high because the stakes, what's at stake is the souls of men or women. Now the word wins again can be translated takes takes souls in the original language. It kind of alludes to hunting and fishing. You want to uh, trap a bird or you're going to use the right bait to bring in a fish. It's not like I'm baiting people to catch them, but I want to give them something good. They're going to die if they're out there on their own. I want to give them something good that they might have life. The Apostle Paul tells us, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus Christ. His goal was not to please the public. He wanted to see people enter into the kingdom. He didn't want to have the biggest church. 
He wanted to see people come into the kingdom of Christ. He didn't want to be the greatest evangelist ever known, even though he was one. He wanted to see people come to Christ. He wasn't out to educate men. He was able to do that. He taught a lot of people. But his goal wasn't educated, education. You know, you can have a lot of educated sinners. His goal was not morality. I'm not out to make men moral. I want them to receive Jesus Christ. And by, by the way, the greatest way for people to become moral is to come to know Jesus Christ. And he can work in your life. Morality will not save you. The best promoter of morality is the gospel. So Paul means nothing less than that some must be born again. You can't save the old nature. It's dead. It's corrupt. The best thing you can do with it is let it be crucified with Christ. And that's why we encourage people in baptism too. It's representative of I've died to my old way of life. The old man is dead. What do we do with old dead bodies? We bury them. And then the symbol continues with the resurrection to newness of life in Jesus Christ. I want that new life, and I'm so excited about that new life, I want other people to have that too. So uh, we read again, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. This is the only way they're going to get to heaven. You've probably talked with a lot of people out in the world, you know, what do you think happens when you die? And they'll say, well, I think I'll go to heaven. Why? Why do you think that? Uh, I'm a good person. You ever lied? Ooh, everybody's lied, haven't they? You ever, you ever cheated? Well, uh, I'm just a little bit. I'm a small cheater. <laughs> I have a friend who used to say a little lie is like being a little pregnant. You either are or you aren't. There's not white lies and black lies, you know. Uh, so you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. And this should be the object of our teaching and our praying in our lives, that some would be born again. Well, how did Paul do this? He didn't uh, do it by creating sensations with startling statements or preaching false doctrines or uh, obtaining the approval of multitudes. He simply preached the gospel. Good news. That's all it means giving out good news. We've got good news for people, right? He prayed a lot. He cried a lot. He had sympathy for each one he dealt with. Sympathy that made him adapt to the situation of each one he was dealing with. And that's how he could become all things to all men that he might win some to Christ. And I'd like to go back up a little bit. That's verse 22 of uh, 2 Corinthians 9. But let's look at verse 19. Though I'm free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law towards God, I'm not just going to go and rob banks and shoot people or something like that. I, I still have my moral limitations, but I can hang with outlaws. I can go and witness to bikers. I, I can go witness to those people because they need the gospel. They need to know Jesus Christ. But I'm going to go and witness to those people too. And he goes on in verse 22, to the weak I become as weak that I might win the weak, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And here's an encouraging word to uh, soul winners. Brethren, this is, this is James, and he's speaking to us. He says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converts him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. You're offering the opportunity for somebody to have eternal life. Nothing else in the world like it, and nothing else in the world offers that to you. You shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. And then here's some instruction in soul winning from Jesus. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Christ has called us by his grace. He's called us just as we are. Uh, it's not after I change, if I go to a class, if I become a better person, if I stop lying, if I stop doing those other things that I do. He wants to work from the inside out. He just wants me to give my life to him, and he's going to make the changes. He can use me the way I am, but as I yield to him, 
He's going to change me. And that's why he says, follow me and I will make you. You follow me, I'll do the work. He can make me into whatever he wants to. He's the potter, I'm the clay. He can make me into a soul winner, the evangelist, the witness he wants me to be. He never said, follow me because of what you are or because of your skills or abilities or because of what you can make yourself. Uh, it's because of what I can make of you. Two things in that verse, think about. Follow. The first one is something for us to do. Follow. The second part is something for him to do. I will make. I'll do the work. I'll do the transformation. Something for him to do, to make us fishers of men. We can give you hints. We can give you keys. We can point the way. But you have to follow him. That means to be separate unto Jesus Christ, to leave your own pursuits, your own goals, and in many cases, your own companions. Many of us, when we came to Christ, left some of our good friends because they didn't want to change. As a matter of fact, they had a tough time with us becoming Christians. Oh, you're going to be good now, huh? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to be better, but it's only by the grace of God and the strength of God, the power of his Holy Spirit, I didn't know enough to say all that, but, uh, you know, I uh, want to. <laughs> I hope so. But we seek his goals and his will for your life. So I'm not saying leave your daily business, leave your family. I'm sorry, I've got to leave the wife and kids at home now. I'm going to go out and be an evangelist around the world. There are people that do stuff like that, but that's not what he's calling for here. Uh, the worldly Christian will not convert the world. Follow me means to obey him, to be like Jesus, knowing and keeping his words. Now, I want to give you five different reasons that we should be a witness. We've asked the question several times now, should we evangelize? So here's five different reasons. Number one, Christ has given a clear command to every Christian. This was the very last command. This is the last thing that he told us to do. What's the last thing Jesus said? I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature, everyone, everywhere. This command is called the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion, as some have taken it. You'll hear it over and over again in the next few weeks. It wasn't intended only for the 11 apostles or the remaining disciples. I want you guys to be the witnesses. This is intended for us today. It's something that goes on. This command is the duty of every man and woman who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. The command has never been rescinded or canceled, and we can't decide which of the Lord's commands we'll follow and which ones we'll obey. Can you imagine if a soldier did that? You've been drafted or you signed up for the military, and uh, your sergeant comes out and says, we're going to march today. You're going to march on the parade grounds. And you go, I can do that. I'll march on the parade grounds, no big deal. I can march. Then he comes out and says, okay, today we're going to fly to a different country and we're going to fight the enemy. Mm, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I don't think I want to participate in that one. You guys want to catch up with me later? Maybe after you come back from doing that fighting thing? I'm not into it. You don't get to pick and choose. You follow orders. You follow the command. And that's what our captain, the captain of our salvation has asked us to do. We should be ready and willing to obey his command. His last word to the church was that he would give us power to be a witness. Again, back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, um, somehow I lost my place on here but that's okay. There we go, Acts 1-8, right? Here's the interesting thing. What's Jerusalem? That was their home. That's where he wants you to begin being a witness. Many of you know that's the toughest place to be a witness. People at your home know you. Oh, it's another fad you're going through. Oh yeah, you did this before. We'll see how long this lasts. They're the toughest people to witness to. And if you can share your faith with them, you can share with everyone. In Matthew 22, the greatest commandment we're told is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
So the church, you and I, should be a worshiping, witnessing unit. We all worship and we all witness. To love the Lord your God with all your heart is to worship. To love your neighbors yourself is to witness, not merely to, res to fulfill your responsibilities of worshiping the Lord as a Christian. Not every Christian is going to be called to be a pastor. Not every Christian is going to be called uh, to be a children's minister. Not every Christian is going to be called to be a foreign missionary. But every Christian is called to be a witness. You've been called to be a witness in the environment in which God has placed you. Public ministry of the word, I believe, is a, a high office, a high calling of God. James warns about that. Be not many masters, knowing you'll receive the greater condemnation. It's not something to be taken lightly. But I also believe that the private witness is something akin to that and in certain ways can be even a higher calling because the message is adaptable to individuals. God will call you to different people to share your faith and your love and God's grace with them. So uh, not only do we have a clear command, we also know that men and women are lost without Jesus Christ. They don't know that they're lost, but we do, and we are called to share with them. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, scripture also reminds us, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. So there are, are many who would argue and say that Christianity is only one way to God. You've probably heard the saying, there's so many paths up the mountain, but the view from the top is the same. That's baloney. They aren't even on the same mountain, okay? They're not going to see the same view. It's not true. They aren't even trying to climb the same mountain. He says to us, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is a claim that Jesus Christ made for himself. Now, even those who are not persuaded by Christianity often have great respect for Jesus Christ. You'll share someone... Uh, with someone, their need for Jesus Christ, and they'll say, well, I respect him. He's a, a great teacher. He's a great moral person. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Uh, among those who reject the idea that was God incarnate, there are others who will follow to some degree. Jesus was a great moral teacher, but he wasn't God. Well, according to this view, Jesus is to be followed as a great human being, but not a divine human, a God. Jesus made astonishing claims, not only about God, society, and ethics, but about himself. He claimed to have authority to forgive sins, to be the representative of all humanity, to come and die in order to reconcile man to God, and to be the only way for people to attain salvation. Faced with the fact that Jesus made these claims about himself, there are three things we might say about him. Either Jesus was a liar, or Jesus was crazy, a lunatic, or Jesus was who he said he was. He's the Lord. The first thing we might say about Jesus is that his claims were false, and he knew it, okay? In which case, he was a liar. And if he didn't believe that the claims were true when he made them, he was lying, Jesus' claims about himself are so central to his teachings that if they were lies, you can hardly deem him a great moral teacher because he's a liar. We don't call those liars great moral teachers. He set out to systematically deceive people about who he was and how their sins were to be dealt with, and he becomes among the worst teachers that the world has ever known. The second thing we might say about Jesus is that his claims were false, and he didn't know it. He thought they were true. Maybe he was delusional. Maybe he thought he was God. And in that case, he was crazy. Jesus believed the claims were true and they weren't. He's a delusional egomaniac. Any ordinary person believes himself to be God incarnate, then that person is quite simply insane. You might have met some of those people. Uh, I have from time to time. Uh, I also met um, Satan in three different people who came to me and said, I'm the devil. I met the Antichrist. I'm the Antichrist. I've come here to, to uh, end the world. I met Peter. Uh, he brought me third Peter. 
his own writings, and he said, I need you to preach this for me, will you? I said, okay, Peter. A little delusional, a little crazy, a little insane. But the third thing we can say about Jesus is that his claims were true, in which case he is the Lord. If Jesus believed his claims about himself were true, and they were, then Jesus was not only a great human being, but God on the earth. If we take Jesus seriously, then we've got to take Jesus' claims about him seriously. We can't say that Jesus was a great teacher whom we admire and look up to, but that the most fundamental element of his teaching was a monumental error. Jesus was not great. Jesus was not merely human. He was either much less than this or much more than this. So in order to show that the best view of Jesus is either Lord or liar or lunatic, is that we would have to demonstrate there's some reason to take his claims seriously. Do we have a reason to take his claims seriously? Many argue that we do, that uh, we have the strongest possible evidence that Jesus knew what he was talking about when it came to the supernatural. Uh, Pastor Ed's made it very clear in the seven miracles in the Gospel of John that they were fantastically supernatural, not something somebody could do with science experiments or put together something that might deceive people as a magician or uh, something like that. There is, it's argued, substantial historical evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead, endorsing his claims to religious authority. The resurrection, uh, it is said, was a divine endorsement of Jesus' teaching. God confirmed that Jesus' teachings were true by resurrecting him from the dead. Uh, there can be no doubt that he only fits in one of these three positions. So the next time somebody says he's a good moral teacher or he's a nice guy and I really appreciate him and I really admire him, find out who they admire. Are you admiring a liar? Are you admiring a crazy person? Or do you really believe he is who he said he was? So uh, we have to take Jesus seriously. Number three, rather than being not interested in the gospel, a gospel, uh, and a lot of people will say that, well, people don't want to hear. They don't really care. They're too busy with their lives and the things they're doing. Rather than being not interested, the people of the world are truly hungry for the gospel. Now, in my life, and it's been a, a long one, I know I look young and everything, but uh, in my life, I've had the privilege to be able to travel to several different countries in the world with the express purpose of sharing Jesus Christ any way we could. And I have to admit that I've often been discouraged in the United States sharing the gospel because people are, you know, we've got a million churches. I know one particular city that had 54 churches up in Oregon. A couple from uh, down in this area moved up there and they said, we want to find a good church. And they spent a year going each Sunday to a different church till they'd been to all 54 churches. And I talked to them afterwards, said, what'd you find? They said, well... We couldn't find one that was teaching the Word of God, so I'm not sure where we're going to go right now. It seems like a lot of Americans are inoculated against the gospel. Uh, we used to be called a Christian country. One of our recent presidents said it's not anymore. Unfortunately, he's right. People aren't serving Christ. They're looking for other things. However, in other countries, I've seen some incredible hunger for the Word of God. And I just want to share some of these briefly. I was in Africa with a brother. We were in Kenya. There was a, an African man there evangelizing. We got to meet him, and he said, would you come out on the streets with me? And we said, okay, we'll come. And uh, he said, play a couple of songs. And this other brother and I played. 600 people gathered on a street corner at lunchtime in Nairobi to hear what we were there to talk about. And 100 of them received Christ. That man is still there, still ministering to those people. That number has grown to 18,000 people who received Christ through that street ministry on the corner. Uh, while we were in Kenya, we ran a clinic. We were dealing with physical healing and spiritual healing. People would come in uh, being hurt, and we'd pray for them, and we'd share the gospel with them. We saw a lot of them come to Jesus Christ. I was able to go to a Maasai birthright. Maasai is one of the tribes in um, Africa in Kenya and every 
so often they have a birthright. There's not enough sons being born to carry on the tribe, to carry on the family name. And women will gather together. Fascinating. And I got invited to this thing by an African chief. And uh, I'm the only white guy there. And I'm, I'm really naive. We had a Land Rover. And we're driving out across uh, Africa somewhere. There's no roads or anything. I have no idea where we're at. But he knew every bush, every tree, every every house, every everything. And we get to this thing and we come rolling up in this uh, Land Rover and uh, I'm honking the horn and I jump out and I'm taking pictures. I love to take pictures. And all these men get upset and they come after me with clubs. And I jump back in the car and I slam the door and this African chief is laughing. And I go, what's so funny? I think these guys wanted to hurt me. He goes, it's funny because you scared them to death. Number one, they've never seen a white person. Number two, they've never seen a car. And number three, whatever this little box is, you're clicking at them, they don't like it. <laughs> They're suspect. But I got to go in and these women gathered around. Interesting ceremony. They believe there is one God and they would march under his flag. His flag was blue and white. You can see it up during the daytime. We don't know exactly how it looks. We can't see the whole thing, but his flag is blue and white. We want to we want to walk under God's flag. And then the elders of the village would take embryonic fluid out of uh, an animal and they would anoint the women and they would pray that the God of heaven would give them sons. And then we get through watching all of this and I'm I'm blown away and the chief looks at me and he goes, "Now, share the gospel with them." And I, I was going, uh, huh. do you have your Bibles with you? Oh, I'm sorry, there isn't a Bible in the Psy language yet. Um, uh, let me tell you about John. Uh, chapter 3, verse 16. What? You can't read? You don't even know what I'm talking about? God gave me a beautiful illustration. It had to do with the fact that he desired the Son would come to earth and walk for him and further his name, further his tribe, further his people. And another example, while I was there, there was a, a little goat tied to a bush. The women were bringing the goats in in the evening, and I said, why is that goat by himself? And they said, oh, he lost his smell. I thought, what? He, he can't smell anything? They said, no, no, his mother can't smell him. Each baby goat has the smell of its own mother's embryonic fluid when they're born. And that's how the mother knows which ones are hers and who she feeds and who she takes care of. Well, if he gets out in the herd and he loses the smell, she's not going to feed him. She doesn't know whose kid it is. And I thought, what a, what a marvelous picture. You know what? God has given me birth. God loves me. But I go out and I hang out in the world and I mess around with everything and, and uh, I lose my smell. I don't look like a Christian. I don't act like a Christian. I don't talk like a Christian. I said, how do we remedy this? And they said, well, they take a pregnant goat's embryonic fluid again, put it on the head of that little goat, and the mother will take care of that goat. God will pour his spirit out upon you. You will smell like the Lord again, and he will take care of you. He knows. So these are the things that I shared with these women. And out of the 300 women, 100 of them gave their lives to Jesus Christ that day. And I'm, I'm feeling totally stupid because I can't relate to these people, but the Spirit of God did because some people were willing to go there and to minister to these people. In the Philippines, another situation with a guitar on a street corner, 250 people came out because they love music. They just wanted to hear what we were singing about. We sang gospel songs. Several gave their lives to the Lord. Went to another place in the Philippines, Camino del Norte, and... Uh, uh, somebody said, let's go over to the school. Let's see if we can get you into the school. And so we go there and we meet the headmaster of the school. This would never happen in America. And we said, uh, look, we got this guy from America. Can he come in and share with you guys? And he goes, really? Okay, I thought maybe we we're going to go from class to class or meet some people at lunch. He said, no, nope, let's get everybody in together for a general assembly. The whole school gathered together. And I got to share my testimony with those people. Uh, just by being willing to go. I, w I was blown away. And uh, oh, these things happen over and over again, flying to and from places. I was traveling with another brother. He wanted the window seat. I wanted the aisle seat. Some poor girl got the seat in the middle between the two of us, and she got bombarded from both sides, all the way from L.A. to Copenhagen, about Jesus Christ and where we were going and what we were doing. It was fantastic. 
In Japan, I got invited to English schools. Uh, yeah, come on in and teach English. You speak English, you can help us out. The fantastic thing was Christian missionaries were there. English classes are very expensive in Japan. They're very desirable, but we'll give free lessons, but we use the Bible as our textbook. And we got to minister to hundreds of kids reading the Bible and teaching them to read English words out of the Bible. By the way, at Christmas time, Japanese schools are still open. It's not like America. So come to our school and tell us what Christmas is all about. And we did. We were able to do that. Many of my friends have told uh, me stories even more incredible from different parts of the world. You've heard some of Greg's stories from Europe. And uh, though I get discouraged here, the Lord has shown me don't get sucked in by the lie of the enemy uh, and not witness in your own backyard. Though some may reject, many are hungry. Uh, we had a food ministry for several years. We would uh, get leftovers from the grocery stores and, and go around San Bernardino and Riverside. We had 22 different locations. The people would come every day to eat physically, and at the same time, we would feed them spiritually. Incredible opportunity. I found that two of the greatest opportunities, I don't consider myself an evangelist in any way, shape, or form, except I'm to be a witness on a regular basis, an individual basis. But the, the greatest place for me to evangelize is weddings and funerals. People come to a funeral, there's somebody that's passed on, hopefully they met the Lord, I don't know, but there are live people there who have gathered and death is staring them in the face. And I get to ask them, are you prepared? Are you ready? You're gonna die, 100%, you're gonna die. Weddings are a wonderful time because I can talk about the relationship between Jesus the Son and his bride, the church. And I try to make a point of every time uh, inviting everyone to the marriage feast of the Lamb, open to all born-again believers. One more story. In Japan, I went to a little restaurant. It was called a grain of wheat. And I thought, what, what does that mean? Why, why do you call your restaurant a grain of wheat? It reminded me of the scripture. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, I, it can't bring forth fruit. And the couple there, a Japanese couple, shared their testimony with me. They said, we had a child. We were Buddhist. And our child died. And uh, we were heartbroken, grief-stricken. And some missionaries came by and told us the love of Jesus Christ. We realized that it took that child dying for us to come to faith in Christ. So we call our restaurant a grain of wheat because we want other people to die to self, to come to life in Jesus Christ. So don't say that there are still four months, then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They're already white for harvest. Look around, vast fields of human souls ripening. And I want to encourage you that we should assume that our family members, that our neighbors, that our co-workers uh, are interested in good news that we have to share. Uh, and uh, it's a lie of the enemy that whispers to you and says they don't want to hear you. True, there are some that don't, but many have gone through a set of circumstances especially in our world today, where the Lord has prepared their hearts to receive Jesus. I wonder if he's leaving us here a while longer just to answer the prayers of those who are seeking. Perhaps they felt alone or in need of love, and we can't afford to be selfish with the good news, especially when there's overwhelming evidence that people are hungry for the gospel. <clears throat> Number four, we as Christians have in our possession the greatest gift available to mankind the greatest news ever announced. I love the old hymn. Some of you that are older may remember this one. It was called, He Lives. He lives, he lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. We serve a living savior. Now that's an amazing thing to me. I actually went to uh, Haifa in Israel where we went to the tomb of Bahu'alah. He's the leader of the Baha'i faith. Guess what? He's dead, he's buried. You can go to Ma uh, Muhammad's tomb. He's dead, he's buried. Joseph Smith is dead and buried. 
Charles Hayes Russell is dead and married. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, she's dead. She's buried. They're dead just like their religion is. When you go to Jerusalem and you go to visit the garden tomb, the place we believe may have been where Christ was buried, there's a sign on the door that I love. It says, he's not here. <laughs> he's risen. Amen. What a, what a difference that makes. He is risen. Not only is he alive, but he lives in us with resurrection power, has assured us of eternal life, died on the cross in our place for our sin, rose from the dead, and we have direct fellowship with him. Why are we so hesitant to tell people about the good news? Why is it that we would rather discuss our uh, politics or uh, our favorite athletic team or uh, the gas mileage, perhaps today it's more the gas prices. Did you see what they're charging over there? That cheap old gas is more expensive than I've ever seen it, you know? Uh, <laughs> we'd like to talk about the smog, the weather, the movies, uh, our children, our grandchildren. I'm guilty. <laughs> and if our faith to Christ means so much, why wouldn't we make that the number one priority to tell people about the king of the universe who gives life and gives grace. And you will find that if you're willing to do that, you will get usually a positive response. There are some negative responses. You can expect that. But the scripture makes this so clear. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God for those who believe in his name. You all know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They're going to perish without him. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son of love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. And the number five reason I've put here tonight for why we should evangelize is the love of Jesus Christ for us and our love for him compels us to share him with others. When you love someone, you want to do things for them. He loves us. He does incredible things for us. I love him. Do I do incredible things for him? I want to. It's the love of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about that he says the love of Christ constrains us or compels us because we judge this that if one died for all then all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again Jesus said he who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I like the way the Living Bible puts that one. It says, the one who obeys me is the one who loves me. Literally, God can measure our love for him by our obedience to him. He'll reveal himself to us, and he reveals what we're to obey. When it comes to witnessing, we have a specific commandment, a specific mandate. We are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. Fulfilling this commission is a duty and a privilege. We share because we love Christ. We share because he loved us. We share because we want to honor and obey him. We share because he gives us a special love and burden for others. And is anything in life more important? That's the question to take home tonight. Is anything life more important? I've come to the conclusion that everything in my life is a setup from God. I used to believe in chance. I used to believe in coincidence. No longer. I used to get upset at circumstances. Bummer, flat tire, middle of the night on the freeway. I, I don't think that's a uh, coincidence anymore. There must be a, a tow truck driver God wants me to witness to. So he's coming out here specifically to me so that I can ride in his truck and tell him about Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that crazy? I believe they're all divine appointments. And instead of becoming upset by the circumstances, I've begun to look for the hand of God in each situation. I pray you would do that too. I would pray that not only you would do that, my prayer for you this week is that you would 
Pray for God to put people in your life. I know sometimes it's hard to go and, and introduce yourself to somebody. Hi, can I tell you about God? There's ways to do that, and we'll talk about that. But sometimes God will just bring people to you. I remember as a very young believer that somebody talked to me about personal evangelism. They said, just pray, God will bring people. And I thought, okay, but I was still very shy, very reserved. I know it doesn't seem like that today, but uh, I put a couple of gospel tracts in my pocket. I thought, I'll take these out, I'll give them to somebody. I left and I saw some people and I didn't want to say anything and I was too weirded out by the whole thing. I went to a drinking fountain and I lean over to get a drink of water and the tracks fall out of my pocket. And a guy walks up, picks them up and goes, are these yours? What's this all about? God brought the man to me. And God can do the very same thing to you. So pray that God would put people in your life to share his love and his grace. So if we are supposed to evangelize, and I hope that that's a conclusion that you've come to, we are to evangelize. Well, then why don't we evangelize? Why don't we share with others? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. That's the plan. Why don't we evangelize? And I'm going to give you five major reasons that we don't evangelize. Uh, we feel guilty about it a lot of times, too. The enemy will come and say, you're no good. You don't really love Jesus. You're not sharing him with other people. And you go, yeah, that's true. I could do better. And I, I feel condemned. Remember, there's now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Ignore that condemnation. God loves you, and God wants to use you. Now, I have a follow-up, because I'm not going to keep you here all night, as some of you know that I could. Uh, but tomorrow, I'm posting the second part of Should We Evangelize? It's a study out of Daniel chapter 2, and it talks about God wanting to speak to people and God wanting to speak through people. God wanted to speak to Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see that in the first part of Daniel chapter 2. And then God wanted to use Daniel to speak through him his truth so that King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, became a Christian. So uh, check that out online tomorrow. It's going to be on the Packing House site. Should we evangelize. God wants to speak to people and through people. By the way, we have another great opportunity coming up, and uh, it's this coming Saturday. Once a month, we actually have a group of people who go out, and they take the Jesus video out. There's a, a, a wonderful brother here. Some of you know him, Kevin. Kevin's a treat. Kevin used to be a Jehovah's Witness, and he loves to go out and evangelize and witness to people. And I said, why are you so zealous for this? He goes, because I spent a lot of years lying to people and leading them in the wrong direction, trying to make up for some time here. Uh, a couple of years ago, he said, you know what? I've finally done it. He laid out a map of Redlands and every home, and he has been to every home in Redlands to share Jesus Christ. And I said, well, now what? He goes, start over. People move. <laughs> New people come into the area, new homes are built. So if you'd like to just go out in a real low-key situation, you're not going to have to be a Bible theologian or anything like that. Saturday morning, 9.30, they gather here. You're just going to go out and pass out, hey, you want a free movie? I have a free movie for you. You'd be surprised how many people are taking it, how many people are listening, and how many people come to the Lord. So check it out. Check out Daniel chapter 2. It'll be posted tomorrow. And check out Saturday if you'd like to meet some other people who have a heart for evangelism. Would you stand with me one more time and let's pray again. Father, we come to you right now and we thank you once again for the opportunity to gather together in this place. Lord, to be reminded of many scriptures that we've heard in a variety of situations and a variety of uh, ways throughout the years. But Lord, we ask that you would help us to put all this together, that we would realize that we would understand that we wouldn't fight the idea that yes we are supposed to tell other people about you lord help us as we discover reasons that we don't want to tell other people lord help us to discover the power that you want to give to us to be a witness and lord we ask that you would give us a burden for souls that we would truly realize that without you people are going to hell for eternity and that's not something we would wish on anybody and then, Lord, we ask that you would give us some methods for evangelism, some different ideas to help us share the gospel, to give out the good news of your love, peace, and grace. And we ask all these things now in Jesus' most holy and precious name. And all of God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here tonight. Go over your notes. And next week we'll continue on. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.